Join me, Phil Stephanie and Russell Gerber on an interactive show designed to give you more insight and context to all things Africam. On point today, Predators on Africam. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all having a great day so far. Some of you waking up to the day, others in the middle, and others coming to the end of it. Thanks again for joining Russell and myself. How are you doing, Russ? Good. How's it, everybody? Good to be back. And we've got Max here putting everything together all the way from Malawi. Folks, we've got a great show lined up for you today. Lots to talk about, so I'm going to crack on with the intro and then we'll get going. As usual, thanks very much for joining us from all over the world. If you have any questions, you'll need to register on the website and then there's a question box. It's always really nice to get your input, answer your questions, have a bit of discussion on the topic. Today's topic is the predators that we see on Africam. Some of them rarer than others, but they're all just incredible to see. And we've kind of put them in an order of hierarchy. We're going to start off with lion. Russell's going to give us a breakdown of lions and all things lions. And then all the other predators essentially try and adapt. And we're going to talk about those individual adaptions against lion. So lions at the top, cheetahs down the bottom, and then some of the smaller, more unusual ones that are always wonderful to see. So Russell's going to start us off with lions. Thanks, Phil. Yes, welcome again, everybody. And yeah, we're going to kick off with, of course, the king of the jungle. Our most, most powerful predators here in Africa, of course, the lions. And here we've got a lovely clip of the beautiful pride of lions, which is, of course, one of the strengths for lions. One of the things that makes them top predators is not just their size and power, but their gregarious nature and the fact that they, of course, rely on each other to hunt and to feed and to support the rest of the pride, even those that are injured. But that size in numbers, of course, helps them to go for bigger prey species, it allows them to go for things that other animals would not attempt and uh, using techniques such as ambush predation where they'll often chase different individuals into different members of the pride and that's certainly one of the most successful ways that they hunt even though they don't have a very high percentage in their hunting success rate and the reason for that is simply their arrogance. They will often go for things that are close by uh, in an opportunistic way. And because they're not the fastest animal compared to our other predators, which we'll come to in a few moments, they will often miss those potential prey species. But they rely on things like the night, their power, and that pride to get at most of their prey and allows them to be really dominant over the other predators in the areas that they often will encounter. Things like hyena, leopard, wild dog, and cheetah, which we'll be getting to in just a few moments. Of course, their power and the pride allows them to be dominant over those different species. If they are fortunate enough to take something down, of course, they are much more able to protect their kill from any other predators that may come around, even a group of hyenas in large numbers, a group of male lions like this, these four males would be a significant adversary to overcome, even for a huge clan of hyenas. And it would be unlikely for them to lose prey to any of those scavengers. We've got a lovely video here of that opportunistic nature of lions. And as I mentioned, though they are bigger and more powerful and do have those prides, they will take any opportunity to take something down if possible. And you can see in this video, a smaller prey species, not something that lions would focus on, particularly in a large pride, but that opportunistic nature is something that lions just don't let go of. 
you can see she was happily having a drink and now she's got her sights set on a potential prey opportunity here you can see she hasn't been seen by that antelope just yet and you'll see what it is in just a moment watch on the left hand side of the screen there she comes at the last minute too late the little impala realizes what's happened so they're very opportunistic if the opportunity arises but in the cases of when their tummies are full and they've had a meal you can see here this lioness just staring down this big giraffe the giraffe is well aware of her presence but She's not bothered about a thing in the world. With a full tummy, lions are really quite brave and don't have any real concerns about scavengers coming to take away those prey or the prey that they take down because of that size and power. And though a large clan of hyenas in this case could chase away a single female, they would be nervous to do so. And it's why the lions are certainly considered top of the predator hierarchy here in Africa. to hear this of course just once in your life that vocalization of course is a territorial call and just another example of that arrogance of lions that they will call out to all animals in the area to remind them we are the big boss and that brings us to the next in line there's a hyena also giving off a call in response so they're number two on the log. The fact that they're calling like this and the lions call as well, it obviously gives away that they are quite confident in their position. But um, <laughs> also quite confident in moving around amongst lions. I don't know if you can see in the left-hand corner there, there's a male lion having a drink. And there was a group of hyenas. There's two more coming out the bush there, another one coming out the back. And that's so typical of hyena, and that's what puts them right up there in the rankings. So hyena typically one-on-one -on -one, doesn't really have a chance against, let's say, the next in line or down at the bottom leopard. But because they move together and they typically live in clans, they're very happy to take on lions uh, even that single male lion with a group of against seven hyenas didn't really have a chance. But as if those lions had to form a pride or if there was a real battle, the sound would bring them, bring more lions in. And then the hyena gets put in its place pretty quickly. <laughs> Here it's trying to pretend to be the top of the log, chasing away the other scavengers. So it's predominantly known to be a scavenger. But actually, they hunt really well. In some areas, like in East Africa and in Gorongoro Crater, they actually, uh, some would say, at the top of the log and give line for their run of their money because there's so many of them. And they actually hunt 90% of the time rather than scavenge. Whereas in areas where there's bigger populations of lions, also bigger populations of other predators, it's much easier to scavenge. So they definitely... I would say right up there when it comes to survival, they'll go for anything from old elephant carcasses to small little uh, scrub hairs and things like that. But if they want to hunt, they hunt really well. They can run long distance for a really long time. That's their, that's their key. It actually gives them a relatively high success rate, right up there around 50% success rate against lions, 20% success rate. But lions try more often, and therefore, ones they miss out on, those will be counted as fails. When a hyena starts to hunt, they actually just jog, they find something, and they take turns and run the animal down, not dissimilar to wild dogs. Uh, they're obviously a little slower, but um, they are quite successful. There's another little scavenger coming in there. We're going to talk about Jack all a bit later, and right up there on the whole survival 
department <laughs> getting around all these bigger predators. But quite interesting to see this hyena moving off with a big chunk of meat. That's one of the ways that they manage to survive. They can have their dens, have their babies far away from where the action and where the competition lies. And they have the strength to take these big lumps of meat, really long distances, those big powerful shoulders to go and feed their offspring. Wild dog have something similar in their bag. Thanks, Phil. Here, so we, here we got a lovely clip of these beautiful wild dog. These are African wild dog or painted dog, depending on who you ask. And of course, their great strength is the pack once again. As you can see, they're much slighter in their body size than hyenas. But that pack and their endurance, similar to the hyenas, they can chase down prey for long, long distances. And because of that reliance on the pack and for one to be chasing, then if that one gets tired, it can fall back and another replace it. They can eventually run down that prey species and tire them out entirely and take them down. And because of that, their success rates are really high, often around 60 to 70% of the time that they chase something, they can take something down. But unlike hyena, they don't have that big, powerful neck. And so they're unable to take food back to the den. They will often actually regurgitate the food for the members of the pack that stay by the den to look after the youngsters or simply are injured and that of course helps them to maintain that higher up hierarchy uh, on the level that we're talking about today and the reliance on the pack is a really important thing for them as a group and for the others that we've chatted about today on the other hand we have things like leopard and cheetah which we'll be getting to and they, of course, rely more on their camouflage and hunting on their own. Here you can see this beautiful clip of a dog taking an opportunity that they've chased an impala into the water. And you can see he's very anxious about going in there. And one of the pack members is already on that impala. And you can see here the struggle going on between the two of them. And that focus of the pack on their prey, thinking that they've got it down, he's not looking around. And if you look to the right-hand side, there's a little visitor coming along in this clip. Another top predator out there, but not one of the ones we'll be focusing on today. But something that they all are afraid of and all have to be careful of. And you can see he manages to just escape. And that is one of the great advantages of Wild Dog, that pack hunting technique. Thanks, Russ. So I'm just going to recap before we move on to the next one. So we've we've seen, we started off with lion, spotted hyena, and wild dogs. So you might start to understand that it's all about them in their space and in their normal family structures. So lion's got speed, it's got power, it lives in big groups. So it's pretty much got all the three main attributes that help them survive. <laughs> um, you know, take spotted hyena. The only one it's really missing is speed. Relatively powerful, obviously, in its neck and its shoulders, but not that nimble, let's say, in a fight. Wild dogs are quite high up on the list because they live in bigger packs. One-on-one, -on -one, a wild dog is right together next door to cheetah, is that I would think. But... Um, so something like leopard is next in line, number four, is individually incredibly powerful. I would say uh, weight to power ratio is probably the most powerful. I've seen big male leopards taking 60 kgs of dead weight straight up a tree. So their ability is unbelievable. I've also seen leopards taking a giraffe baby up a tree and a giraffe is born at around 100 kgs. So their brute strength is absolutely incredible. They, their biggest problem is that they're solitary. They choose to be solitary. It's quite a nice way to live. 
You don't have to share the food that you catch. You also have a quite a, a, a large variety of food. You can go from anything from rodents through to fish to baby giraffe, <laughs> which is one of the reasons and one of the things that make leopard a really successful predator. Not so much in a predator hierarchy. And also we don't get to see them that often on these cameras, but I would say it's one of the real special things to see on AFRICAM because we don't disturb them. Leopards are really untrusting. If they hear a car coming along or, or even have a suspicion of any humans, they disappear. I'm sure you'll remember us on many game drives where you're following the tracks of a leopard and it just moves off the road and you drive around the block and it comes back and walks on top of your tracks. So when one thinks about rarities and unusual predators to see, leopard is right up there, but not because of the lack of leopards. There's actually quite a few, and you'll also notice that whenever we have highlight videos of leopards and we see incredible things like this, climbing the trees and interacting with giraffe and things, it's always at night, sort of 90% of the time. So they do move during the day, but they are absolute masters of the evening. They sneak around, they're very untrusting, so they survive really, really well. This image is great of them climbing trees. Obviously, one of their biggest adaptions uh, against things like hyenas and lions and wild dogs is whatever they manage to kill, they have the ability to climb the tree with their food. Now, the other predators can climb. <laughs> I remember seeing a big male lion trying to climb the tree to get the leopard's kill. Climbing up the tree was no problem, but it was so clumsy on its way down it took it about 45 minutes to get the courage to come down and it literally fell out of the tree. So they don't have the skill that leopards have. And there's a great documentary out there uh, where you can see leopards actually hunting vervet monkeys in the very tops of Natal mahogany trees in Botswana. So they truly are quite incredible survivors. Yeah, we have, again, talking about unusual and rare sightings is two leopards together, and the only time that you'll see them together, or more, is obviously mum with her offspring, or mum and dad making the offspring, <laughs> as we see here, which is very unusual. The female presenting herself, the males acting quite relaxed and nonchalant, and if he must, he'll do what he needs to do. But they'll stick together for a day or two, mating, and that's it. They'll behave like that every 10 to 15 minutes for 48 hours or so, and then they'll split off again. So when you do get to see them as twos, it's quite unusual, as are these two, Russ. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Phil. Yeah, these, of course, are our other spotted cats. This is Cheetah. And just like Leopard, they tend to spend a lot of time on their own. Yeah. The time you'll see them together is in the small male coalitions. You'll often see a few boys together who will stick together, and they'll almost always be brothers. And they will hunt together for most of their life and allow them to cover a larger home range, have a few more females in there. But the big thing about cheetah and why we've got them quite low down on the hierarchy, of course, is they, though they have extremely exceptional adaptations for hunting that speed to chase down just about anything out there they have to focus on smaller things because of their slighter body they tend to be solitary hunters besides those coalitions like i mentioned but also because of their size they tend to lose kills a lot to scavengers so things like hyena leopard lion even wild dogs can and do chase off cheetah from their kill and because of that more often than not they'll have to actually kill a couple of times before they get to eat it all on their own you can see here in this wonderful video a full and fat cheetah looks like him and his brother and look who's chasing him off none other than a baboon <laughs> <laughs> 
Not one of the bigger ones we've been chatting about. And it just goes to show you how, unfortunately, Cheetah, they've got a lot of troubles out there when it comes to hanging on to their food. But for the most part, you'll see they will avoid conflict as much as possible. An injury for Cheetah is almost a death sentence in many cases. And they have to be so careful to keep themselves free of injury to allow them to use those adaptations for speed to take down their prey. And when they do, they try to pull it into a shady area away from the others and out of sight as much as possible so that it doesn't get scavenged. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, some interesting footage. I think that those baboons are hoping to be part of this list. I reckon they'd be pretty high on it. Folks, um, I just want to take a little break here. There's lots of questions. So nice to see. So let's answer some of those questions, Russ, before we move on. So the first question is from Paul um, about cheetah and why are they not part of the big five? Yeah, quite an interesting question there, Paul. Um, the Big Five is essentially or historically a hunting term, which has been brought over into the photographic safari world. <laughs> <laughs> and so originally the Big Five were the five most dangerous animals to hunt. And cheetah actually is, of course, a big predator, beautiful predator, um, but is really quite timid. It's actually one of the, I think, unfortunately, but one of the predators that people in days gone by have managed to keep as pets. <clears throat> so they, they're not as dangerous to the hunting world back in the old day as, say, a lion or leopard. So I hope that answers your question, Paul. And the next one we got from Rose, and I hope we answered your question about what we saw in our video a little earlier. Does the camera ever catch lions going after their prey? Not that I ever want to see that. Well, Rose, it does happen from time to time. You know, it's a, it's a difficult thing for a lot of people to watch. It depends on the, on the person and depends on what you see. Um, it can be quite brutal. And depending on the size of the prey species, sometimes they, the power of that prey can actually help them stay alive for a long time before they're finally snuffed out by the predators. So I absolutely know what you mean. I've had many guests out there in the bush who all they wanted to see is to see a kill. And when it does, well, we are fortunate enough to actually see that, most people are not that comfortable with watching it all go down. So I totally hear what you're saying. But from time to time, we do catch these things on the camera. So thanks for the question, Rose. And there's another one here from Susie. Would a hyena kill a lion? Yeah, I think there's it's potentially a 50-50 in the ring there. It had to be the referee. <laughs> um, but hyenas... One-on-one, -on -one, I would say no. If you took them one-on-one, -on -one, I think line power ratio and, and ability to move, let's say, in a, in a battle would far outwit and be superior than an individual hyena. Obviously, if the hyena happened to get a grip on a limb, they've got very powerful jaws, would definitely inflict some nasty wounds, but I don't think it would kill it. What makes hyena quite formidable is its numbers. So you often see if there's one lioness, say, on a kill and three or four hyenas come along, they'll call each other, they'll, they'll give that usual howl, but that laughing sound that I think uh, the Lion King has made them quite famous for, but that is when they get really excited. You'll hear that cackle laugh. And that's actually attracting all hyenas in the area. And then that lion has a problem. Typically, they would try and move away. But if that lion tries to defend itself, uh, it, it would very likely be killed by a group of hyenas. Hyenas are extra cautious, say, uh, when it comes to the big male lions. There you're talking about 250-odd kgs. 
of an animal that is really incredibly powerful. A big male lion that knows what it's doing will take down a buffalo on its own. Um, so they, they know that that's a different individual. But but one-on-one -on -one lion will take out pretty much anyone. Hmm. Are there any more questions before we move on? Well, I wanted to just add there quick for, you know, one of the things we haven't really touched on is, of course, the, the youngsters. And between all of the different species we've discussed, if one of the uh, different species happens to come across cubs of another species, unfortunately, with competition, we'll often see that those cubs will get killed. And I have also in the past seen a hyena cub uh, in the mouth of a lion and vice versa. And it's a sad reality of this competition and hierarchy that we've been chatting about. Folks, we'll get, we'll hopefully have time for more questions or answer them. But as we move from these cheetah, the baboons still trying hard to be part of the show. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do a show on them. They are quite impressive. But we're going to start to talk about some of the more unusual predators that we get to see. And the first one is the brown hyena. Now, to see these animals anywhere is really special. They're incredibly shy. They're almost 100% nocturnal. And what's interesting about them is that they, they actually hide away as a family group during the day and then they come out at night and they move around on their own looking for things to feed on by themselves now as far as scavenging goes they really that's what they mainly do they sometimes hunt but they're not really made up for that they'll be looking for any bits of leftovers they possibly can and because they need the freedom to actually not share any of the food that's why they move around on their own whatever they find they don't need to share and so that puts them in a very vulnerable position having to move around on their own the one thing that they do have as an adaption is that hairy shaggy coat that you see there they can flex that right out and almost double their body size. So visually making them look much bigger and scarier than they are. But they also have a pretty hardcore growl stroke roar. I've seen that actually at Tao. They were busy battling uh, at a kill site and they managed to chase a lion off just by voice and visual. <laughs> Russ, now we've got a couple of the smaller ones. Maybe run us through these before the end of the show, and maybe we have time for one or two more questions. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the most common small little carnivores that we see around the bush, of course, is jackal. And in the region, we, see, we tend to get the black-backed and side-striped jackals. They have fairly similar diets, and for the most part, they will try their luck at scavenging from the bigger predators as much as they can. They are pretty quick and nimble off the mark. Uh, and they will sneak in, often under the nose of a lion, to grab any little morsel that they can. But of course, are good hunters on their own. And from time to time, you'll actually see them even grab a bird, often pigeons, by the waterhole. They'll catch them unawares. So they're pretty common, and we see them pretty often around the early morning and early evening on the cameras. This one is not common at all, Phil. I don't know if you want to tell us all about this special sighting yeah. we had. Beautiful serval. In fact, I wasn't sure that we even seen a serval, but we had to dig into the archives. It's disappeared <laughs> there, but that's a really unusual one. And so we're going to stop there as the servals moved off. So as you can see, we've seen some incredible mix of predators here. I'd like to answer two more questions as it is really nice to have your input and thanks for putting in the questions. Rose, you're asking a question here with regards to essentially predators and people that surround the national parks and, and do they ever come into conflict essentially? I think that's what I get from your question and they, they do, but the spaces that they have to move around in, they, they, they're way big enough, especially for lions, hyenas, Leopards, those are all territorial 
predators. If any animal goes out, if any predator goes out, the national parks work very closely with the surrounding people to get them back in, essentially. Wild dogs and cheetahs don't have territory, so they move a fair amount. But the fact that we have national parks and protected areas and good relationships with the people that live around uh, where we have our cameras, it actually works quite well and limits the conflict. And Russ, I don't know if you want to answer the last questions. Yeah, we got a question from Andre Ran. Thank you for the question, Andre. Aren't hyenas bothered by it when the meat is already partly rotten? It's a very good question and something we get asked quite often. Of course, you know, for some someone like us or humans, of course, to eat meat that would be that rotten or going off, it would be a major problem for our digestive system and for the potential of infection. Hyenas have a acidity content in their stomach far higher than uh, humans. Um, it's actually much more lower pH, um, making it really acidic and allows them to break down a number of those bacteria a lot more than us. But even so, from time to time, hyenas do get upset stomachs from what they eat. And even hyena at times will avoid certain types of bacteria or types of rotten meat if they can. But uh, it does cause them problems from time to time, and they can get sick for a few days normally. But for the most part, because of that acid content, they will recover and then continue along their way. So I hope that answers your question, Andre. Wow, it almost seems like we might need to do a, a second episode on the predators. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great topic, and I'm, I guess most people just love the predators. Um, folks, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, keep looking out for predators on AfriCamp. Thanks so much for your input and all your questions. On the other hand of the scale, next week we're thinking about doing all the smaller and more unusual things. There's some questions with regards to snakes and some unusual things that we see on the cameras. So look out for that next week. <laughs> Folks, have a great day further. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll catch up with you. Actually, I'll catch up with you tomorrow <laughs> on the Afternoon Hide Show. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure as always, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Max. Thanks, Enjoy Russ. Enjoy Phil's show tomorrow. I'll see you guys next week. Cheers for now. <laughs>